Good evening, everyone. My name is Shana Luck. Uh, I'm a reporter. I'm a reporter with CBC News Nova Scotia. I'm also your host for this evening's event, the Open Dialogue Live event. It's called Working Alongside AI. So artificial intelligence and machine learning systems are presenting new choices in many domains from healthcare and law through to my own field in journalism um, and also in advertising. From diets of data, machines are producing bodies of knowledge. And as this exchange accelerates and becomes more complex, so do the questions. So tonight we're going to explore some of those questions. The first question for many people, of course, you're probably asking, what is AI? So we have a definition that we're working with. AI is defined as the theory and development of computer systems able to simulate and perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. Some examples of that include visual perception, speech recognition, translation between languages. And these machines are programmed to think like humans and mimic their actions. So with that, I'd like to introduce your panelists for this evening from the Faculty of Computer Science at Dalhousie University. First up, we have Dr. Nur Zinser Haywood. Dr. Zinser Haywood is a full professor of computer science. Her research interests include machine learning for cybersecurity, network monitoring, and service analysis. She has published over 200 fully reviewed reviewed papers and has been a recipient of several best paper awards. She is an associate editor of the IEEE Transactions on Network and Service Awards. She is an, associ an associate editor, excuse me, um, of, the, of the IEEE Transactions on Network and Service um, Management and International Journal of Network Management. I'm getting lost in my script here. She is a tech columnist at CBC's Information Morning. She's also a board member on CSCAN and InfoCAN. And she's a member of the IEEE and the ACM and a recipient of the 2017 DNS Women Leaders on, in the Digital Economy Award. Welcome there. So next up, we have Dr. Derek Riley. Derek is an associate professor in the Faculty of Computer Science, where he co-directs the Graphics and Experiential Media Lab and chairs the HCI Visualization and Graphics Research Cluster. His research generally explores post-desktop computer interfaces, particularly their relationship to the built environment and to human physicality. This includes research in immersive visualization, mobile computing, mixed reality environments, interactive exhibits, and whole body interaction. And last but not least, we have Dr. Paul Ralph. Dr. Ralph is an award-winning scientist, an author, a consultant, and computer science professor. His research intersecting software engineering, project management, and co human computer interaction has been published in so premier software engineering outlets, including the International Conference on Software Engineering and IEEE Transactions on Software Engineering. He has received funding from Google and the National Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. He holds a PhD in management from the University of British Columbia, and Dr. Ralph is also the founding director of the Empirical Standards for Software Engineering Research. So welcome, everyone. So we are going to uh, begin with a panel discussion. We will get to audience questions uh, about halfway through the hour, um, so please get your questions ready. But um, to start with, let's go to our panelists. Uh, I will go to you first, Derek, because I know you've been thinking about uh, the history and the context of AI here. I'm, I'm wondering, we talked about a definition of AI off the top, but what do you think about uh, when we talk about AI and how has it made our world a better place? Okay, uh, those are two two big questions. I think in terms of what HC, or rather HCI, what AI is, um, I think that's a really important question for everybody to, to answer. The reason being that we tend to lump so much into this term of artificial intelligence. Um, we need to dis demystify the, the word artificial intelligence uh, and break it down into what it really is, which is a set of different techniques and tools that have advantages and disadvantages for different purposes. So we need to be able to understand uh, you know, that artificial intelligence is a heterogeneous set of technologies, not uh, a, an all-seeing eye. 
Um, as for uh, what uh, good has come out of artificial intelligence, I think if we take an historical lens, um, we see that essentially from the dawn of computer science, we've been trying to create systems that allow, that augment human intelligence in some way, right? That either serve as extensions of memory or that allow us to work collaboratively better together um, or that augments other cognitive abilities that we have. And there have been some successes. Uh, the successes don't necessarily involve what we might traditionally consider to be artificial intelligence. They can be simple things like hypertext, the mouse, uh, graphical user interfaces. Uh, all of these things allow us to use our own visual perception in ways that, uh, that are effective for computing. Um, when we look at how we can engage then some of the automated uh, techniques in AI with some of these human computer interaction mechanisms. We see a, a couple of, of marked successes and a couple of marked failures. I will talk about those, but maybe not right now because I, I think I'd, I'd rather hear what Nur and, and Paul have to say um, regarding the successes and the definition of AI as well. Um, so, okay, let me jump in. <laughs> and, uh, well, I am a computer network cybersecurity researcher. So I'm looking at this from that perspective. And uh, for me, as a researcher, AI is another tool in my toolbox. And um, I am not the only one, actually, in computer networks and cybersecurity uh, who is using uh, this, this tool. Um, uh, let's just take a step back. I don't know if you at all think about how many mobile systems are in the world right now. So um, I ask this question, of course, the omni-god Google, and Google comes up with good statistics. And it, one of the uh, UN-based uh, statistics uh, as of 2020, we have more than 10 billion mobile devices connected to the internet. More than 10 billion. To give you an idea, the population of the world is just a bit less than 8 billion. So we surpass the connections to the internet from the mobile perspective in 2018. And I haven't added all the wired connections to this picture. Now, just let's concentrate on mobile connections as our cell phones, our smart devices. AI has a very good use in these devices. Every single one of us who owns one of these devices actually using AI as a tool without knowing. And the background is running. You know what it is doing? There's an algorithm called independent component analysis. And this algorithm all the time is using um, the, the, the phone to uh, do noise cancellation. When I say noise cancellation, anything in the background, like imagine we are in the, I don't know, once upon a time, we used to be in parties, uh, cluster together, talk together, all that background noise, if somebody calls us on our cell phone, is canceled by this algorithm. So we are carrying it, we are using it, and it's working for us. This is one of the good examples, but cybersecurity full of good and bad ones, which I'll come back later. <laughs> Um, a lot of people think of AI as being like people, right? People imagine androids like robots that look like people or more simply chatbots or things that have a face that talk to you or listen to you speak, right? And that's what they think of as being AI. Uh, but AI is um, hidden in far more mundane, everyday things that we use. So when Netflix tells you uh, what it thinks you might want to watch, that's AI. When Spotify figures out what it thinks you want to listen to, that's AI. When Google Maps tells you this is the way that you should go to work, not that other way, this way will be faster, that's AI. Um, AI is hidden in robotic vacuums and smart speakers and sometimes even in more mundane things like um, heating control systems and stuff. Uh, so when you, when you think of, many people think of it, AI in terms of generalist AI. 
that's like a thing that acts like a person that really acts like a person that tries to like trick you and make you think it is a person. But most AI is not that. Most AI is specialist AI that's that's basically just concerned with predicting stuff like what you want might want to watch or listen to or what way you should go to work. So Paul, you said AI is about predicting stuff and, and it, we've, we've talked about how it's all around. It's, it's predicting things, it's recognizing patterns. Uh, how possible is it that an AI would one day become able to recognize patterns that we, we aren't able to recognize? Yeah, so that, that's already happened, right? Uh, contemporary AI systems already can find patterns in large amounts of data that, that human beings can't see, either because the patterns are too subtle or the data sets are too large. Um, if you think about all of the data that is collected by, for example, a large array of radio telescopes, um, no human being can look at it. It's, it's too big. It's too voluminous. You just can't comprehend it. You couldn't hold it in your mind at once to see patterns in it. But see, that ability of AI systems to find patterns in, in data that human beings can't really look at is, is part of the problem. Because AI is often used to hide human rights abuses. Often, and I don't mean like big dramatic human rights abuses of murder. It's, I'm talking about like minor acts of discrimination by financial institutions and town councils and just, just everyday, Im, the everyday immiseration of humans. So when the AI system finds a pattern that we can't see and can't understand, most AI systems also don't explain where their predictions come from or they can't explain the patterns that they found. So for example, uh, financial institutions use AI systems to decide who gets a mortgage and to some extent what rates they should be charged, but mostly just who gets a mortgage, right? And I want you to imagine that like, and so, so some of these systems have been found to be, to be discriminatory on various protected grounds in Canada. I want you to imagine that there's a person at a bank who, like your job is to give out mortgages at a bank. And instead of an AI system, you've got a checklist you know, you've got a pen and a pa and paper and you have to add up a bunch of points. And so you ask people a bunch of questions about like how much money they make and how much education they have and how much investments they have. And you try to figure out how safe they are for a mortgage. And so imagine one of those questions is what color is their skin? And based on the color of their skin, they get a different number of points. Well, you would look at that and go, this is obviously racist. And that, that information would come out. We'd all find out. The news would find out. Someone like Shana would be like, guess what I found on the evening news, right? And everyone would know, right? And then the bank would get in trouble. But now, instead of that, the bank uses an, an, an artificially intelligent predictive system that comes up with some numbers that represent your chance of defaulting on a mortgage. And those numbers, not every bank, not all the time, but often those numbers are discriminatory. But it's really hard to prove because the AI system can't tell you why it thinks this person will default and this other person won't. Nur, I saw, I saw you nodding when when uh, when Paul talked about how AI don't necessarily explain what they're doing. Um, you going? This is a good point. So so I just want to go back to um, Shana, your the definition you you made that start with, and that's a very good definition. And as a um, network and cybersecurity researcher, I actually um, uh, hang on to uh, an important part of that definition for my research. Okay, so so I don't want to generalize it for the whole world, but for my research, which is networks and security, the the definition has the word intelligence so so artificial intelligence is most part to my mind important part is that part that is intelligence so we have to somehow define intelligence and how we define it i think is not one size fits all okay not for human beings and definitely not for algorithms yeah um there are different ways of defining intelligence even for human beings right from social intelligence all the way to call it mathematical intelligence so now take a step back then as a researcher in cybersecurity, i need to define what intelligence will mean for me so for this one i want to use um 
uh, a definition that a neuroscientist from University of California give for the word intelligence. So he defines, uh, this is Richard Heyer, um, he defines um, intelligence as a catch-all word that means the mental abilities most related to responding to everyday problems and here where I come for me, the most important parts, not only everyday problems, but navigating the environment. Okay. So I want you to, from my perspective, I want you to um, pay attention what the environment is. If we are talking about networks, the environment is all those mobile devices, the 10 billion of them I defined, um, all the uh, uh, cables that go under the ocean, all around the world, in our lands, um, all the servers in the cloud or our server rooms, all the desktops and laptops and printers that we connect with cables. All of this is our environment. So we are talking about billions and billions and billions of machines and their connections, and they are communicating with each other. Now, another important thing is the quality of service in this environment from network perspective. As network and service management researcher, quality of service I define as throughput, how much data we push, and the delay, how quickly it will be. Yeah. So when you talk about this kind of an environment, there is no way, but you are going to automate. Otherwise, you cannot scale. You cannot keep up with it. So this is a network part. Now we are adding a layer, which I agree in many ways with Paul, that this layer security is very hand in hand with privacy. OK, so now I'm going to put my teacher's hat. When I teach computer networks, I talk about uh, cybersecurity and denial of service attack. Most of you probably heard. But there's a very real story about a denial of service attack back in 2007 in a small country called Estonia. Um, I don't know how many of you know Estonia. It's a European country in the North Baltic Sea kind of region. And in 2007, they had less than one and a half million population. And 90% of their population, this is a fact, was doing online banking back in 2007. 90% was paying their car park fees on their mobile devices, again, back in 2007. So at the time, when people talk about what the future will look like, i.e. 2021, they said, oh, something like Estonia, but for the whole world. And there is some truth in it, because look at us, we are doing similar things right now, right? But maybe not 90% of us were doing it back in 2007. And you know what happened? In one spring morning, this country, after moving the statue of Stalin to a different location in their capital, started seeing huge increase in their network traffic to the country, to every site of the country, newspapers, TV channels, banks, you name it, schools, hospitals. At first, they thought everybody is watching them because they are doing something extraordinary. So nobody raised the red flag. But in less than 24 hours, the country's whole bandwidth was actually um, um, totally eaten up by this traffic and it was attacked. They were under an attack and the attack was automated. The defense at the time had to only defend the country by unplugging Estonia from the internet. So then they bring in the experts. They are the human experts. One by one, they vetted every single traffic to be able to put Estonia back on the internet. So what this tells us that when we use any automation the attackers are using, the defenders needs to use automation, but automation that the human expert can trust, automation that the human expert can understand. I don't want to take more time. I gave a good lecture about Estonia <laughs> and their attack. I'll leave it there and move, move it to Derek, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, that's a really good segue really when you're talking about, you know, uh, automation that the user can trust and understand because the one of the first examples of a failed, uh, let's say, AI, um, at least uh, one that we 
we cover in human computer interaction research that we're aware of is, has to do with photocopiers. So Xerox uh, created an expert system, uh, which is essentially imagine trying to embody all the knowledge of an expert into an algorithm, a rule-based algorithm. So this is not the data-driven AI that we're used to today with machine learning, but more of a uh, rule taught, to, you know, rule-based uh, system. Um, so you ask the the oracle a question, you know, oh great photocopier, what shall I do now? And it uh, works through the series of of uh, the current state of the system and your question, and then comes up with the perfect solution. And uh, um, a uh, researcher uh, by the name of Lucy Suchman uh, studied uh, people using these photocopiers. Seems like a mundane situation, uh, but actually, uh, in so doing, uh, she was able to. Um, establish one of the fundamental issues with working with AI from a human computer interaction standpoint. And that is that um, people don't, like people sort of have plans about how they will, like how they'll live their lives and how they'll, where, where they'll go next. But those plans are, are kind of emergent. They're not, they're, you might have a plan, but it's a, it's a resource. It's not a prescription in terms of how to live your life. So if you have a rule-based system that's telling you, you know, what your next step will be. Well, that's not always actually what your next step is. And we see the same kind of thing again and again with a lot of these intelligent assistants, right? So um, if I wake up in the morning and I'm going to work, you know, my phone might recommend, you know, here's a route to get to work, right? And that might work eight times out of 10. But if that evening I didn't sleep very well and I wanted to clear my head and take a walk, then I w I'd be taking a different route because I'd be parking somewhere away from my office and then walking, you know, uh, the rest of the way to work. And those kinds of, uh, you know, uh, contextual factors are, they're not accessible uh, to, to the AI, right? Those details about human experience and emotion, the whims and the, 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 the changing nature of the lived experience, of the context that we're in, we, we socially create this context right now, right? And we can choose to shift it at any moment. And it's difficult for a machine that's based on, uh, on data to predict uh, in every case and in every instance, um, you know, what, what we want and what we will do. I, I don't know about you, Derek, but I've never trusted my photocopier. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly, and you shouldn't. Those darn photocopiers, I'll tell you. Yeah. Could we trust AI? Uh, you know, we will if if they're not explaining, if they can't explain their reasoning to us, um, and it's sort of something that is is a little bit opaque to the average person like me. Um, is it okay if I just uh, say go with it, and I don't understand how an AI arrived at a particular conclusion? Um, okay, here is a question: How many of you drive? <laughs> I do, all of us. Do I understand how my car works? I mean, yeah, at a high level, I know there is a motor, I have a gas pedal and a brake. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't even go this much, Derek. You are good, right? Um, so I don't know. Um, where I'm going with this is that sometimes we are comfortable in using things that we understand at a high level, but we still use them and trust them somehow. Right. And other times it's not. Um, and I think it comes down to obviously personal choices as researchers, uh, as a network and cybersecurity researcher. I've been working with AI algorithms for over a two dec decades now, but nobody told me work this way. Right. This is a personal choice. Um, but then we, it comes down to using them in situations such as Estonia. I think trust, understanding, um, and and uh, experience for the human expert is very important. And I think one gains experience, understanding, and at some level trust by knowing the ins and outs of what you are using. So to me, it's not going to happen like a switch. It might take years or maybe decades, depending on the... Uh, on the topic, on the objective where we are using this tool, that the learning ins and outs and, and trusting and understanding will change. And if it is Noor, it will take decades, I'm telling you. If it is someone else, it might take less. 
even driving, learning to drive was not that easy for me. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> I don't know about should, but many experiments show that people trust recommendations and predictions more if they are explained. So what, do, what does that mean then for this context of, of AI? Well, AI, many AI researchers are trying to figure out how to make the algorithms more able to explain their predictions. Uh, but the, the work is in early stages right now. Uh, and it may be some time and it, and there, and it, it may be some time before it works well, and it may never work well in some domains. It's, it's not like, it's not like a thing where all of the predictions will suddenly be explainable. Like it might work for traffic patterns, but it might not work for climate. Uh, it, de it depends on the domain. Yeah. I mean, I, to build on NER's uh, car example, I mean, I might not know exactly how a car works, but I know that somebody does, including the people that built the car. And with uh, some kinds of deep learning uh, AI, that's not actually the case, right? So you've got, you know, these, uh, you can't really understand, as Paul was saying, you can't really understand why the insurance AI is denying this person or, you know, giving a premium that's way, way above what you might expect otherwise. Um, and so I think you have the right to mistrust or at least ask for uh, an explanation as to why uh, an AI is doing the things that it's doing. In fact, it's our responsibility <laughs> as citizens to ensure that, you know, that we're not lo loosing the reins, uh, you know, and, and having these systems make, deci make bad decisions, right? Um, and, you know, to go back on you know, the, the photocopier in the context example, we live in a dynamic society as much as my, my day changes time at moment to moment, so does society. And uh, if we're building on the past, which is what data-driven AI is doing, uh, how does it accommodate, you know, the changes in the future, the, the, the changes that are afoot in the future? It tends to ignore those things and uh, are, are treated as noise. And, and that's not what you want in many cases. That seems like a, a good time to ask. We, we, I know we wanted to talk about how is AI affecting society? It can, Maybe can we start off, Paul, maybe could you start us off with some examples of what you think? Yeah. So there's several things here, right? Uh, and it depends on the way that the AI is used. But certainly AI is shifting power away from individuals and in, away from governments and toward private corporations. So every time a human worker is replaced by a machine, it shifts power toward capital in the economic sense of like people who own stuff and away from labor in the economic sense of people who work for a living. And those shifts in power are destabilizing to our society. So, you know, bef before relatively recent history, we had a much, the world had much a different kind of economy where a small mm -hmm. number of people had all of the money, the aristocracy, and they owned everything and ran everything. And everyone else had very little freedom, very little ability to, to do anything. They had no rights uh, and they had no resources. And we live in a very special period of history where we have a group of people called the middle class. Uh, and we, one of the ways that we judge the health of society is by the percentage of people who are in the middle class, not really poor, not really rich, the number of people who are in the middle. And the more people who are in the middle, the healthier our society is. The increasing automation of everyday work using AI and other means transfers power away from the middle class and toward capital. And that could over time, not just could, but is likely to over time, um, move us back toward the medieval world where there were a small number of people who owned everything and ran everything and made all the decisions and everybody else was poor and had very little freedom. And that sounds really abstract and like, and like a sort of huge change that like couldn't really happen, but it's not so abstract and it is not just could happen, but it is happening. Um, there is, there is a definite trend toward higher rates of unemployment because basically there's entire classes of jobs that are being absorbed by AI. And 
there are an increasing number of people where most of the things that they can reasonably do, most of the things we could reasonably expect them to do for work are cheaper for businesses to automate. I just want to take a pause for a second and remind our audience that uh, we're going to open it up to questions. Uh, if you have any, please uh, give them to us. And But then now I'm going to jump back in and ask, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to respond to that idea, Derek, you know, that, um, that Paul brought up of uh, AI sort of causing this uh, almost, it, it sounded to me almost like a class-like shift in our society. What, what do you think of that? You know, I, I'm going to stay in my lane uh, as a as a human computer interaction researcher. Um, I don't really, I mean, I don't have, uh, and this is part of the issue, actually. To be honest, a lot of computer science researchers, the people that and practitioners, the people that are developing AI, uh, don't necessarily fully appreciate the societal implications of the systems that they develop, and. Um, we in computer science are, you know, and computer science education in particular, uh, are realizing that uh, a, a big part of an effective computer science education is a grounding in ethics, a grounding in the history of technology and a technology as a human endeavor uh, it, that has societal impact. Um, and uh, so the court, whereas in, you know, five to 10 years ago, in the typical computer science program, you might have taken one semester of ethics and ethics covered the gamut of everything from privacy and security to uh, you know, the ACM, Association for Computing Machinery Code of Ethical Conduct, which was just offered as a suggestion at the time. Uh, you know, um, but now we're, we're, um, we're seeing that uh, part of uh, an effective computer science education involves experiential uh, uh, engagements in outreach with communities to see the impacts, to understand those impacts. And that it has always been, or at least mostly always, been a part of human computer interaction coursework <laughs> and research, less so in some of the more core computer science algorithm focused machine learning contexts. But that is changing. Uh, that's really changing in both education and research. So it doesn't exactly, it's, it's not my take on, on, on what Paul said specifically, but it, it does, I mean, I think what Paul has, has stated did raise a general issue, I think, that is at the core of uh, responsible use of, of, of these technologies. Um, that's actually a very good point. Um, uh, I think all these discussions in the computer science uh, community, and to my mind, engineering, science, technology, STEM topics as a whole, um, actually started a really good initiative in the IEEE, uh, which is our international institute, right, worldwide. Um, so uh, this is uh, initiative is called, it's a global initiative, and it's called uh, ethics of autonomous and intelligent systems. And this is exactly the points that Derek and Paul are making that, that IEEE is starting as a, as a framework and initiative to start this discussion. And there are, they identified, um, uh, uh, it, it's a pretty, uh, in my opinion, a good way of starting the conversation on these issues. And they identified three pillars. And these pillars are what we are discussing, human values, Okay, and uh, also data agency and technical dependency. Hence, the generalization, at least my from my network cybersecurity perspective, human values, the trust, understanding, data agency, the security, and its generalization and robustness. So, I think this is, um, to my mind, a very good first step to think about how ethically aligned design can happen, um, both from personal choices, but as well as society, collective choices. And um, I think, you know, I know like what you guys say, I always stop and think as a computer scientist researcher, um, what is our, um, as a stakeholder, what is our share in this, good or bad? Um, and there is no one single answer in the sense that, um, 
you know, when you start thinking about it, if these tools are used for, let's call bad objectives, it can be really harmful, as Paul describes. And um, if they are used for good objectives, yes, we can achieve empowerment. But I don't want to get kind of too much depressed by always thinking the bad. I'm thinking even the bad example might be something good for us. You know, this is what I'm thinking that um, when going back to my car example, right? Um, when we are going through our driving test, um, no one asks us a test question, written or oral, where it says, okay, imagine yourself, you're in the car, you might, because of some environmental condition, end up hitting to a bus, which is a school bus carrying X many kids in it. Versus if you turn around, there is sidewalk, you can take the car to the sidewalk, but unfortunately there is one person going by. Which one are you going to choose? No one puts this as a test question to us. We never answer this in our writing and driving exams. Yet, when we have to create an unmanned vehicle, this is what some computer scientists end up going to program. What are they going to do? Normally, these topics that we don't discuss, but now technology, the revolution, call it AI, call it computer science, call it ethically designed systems, is forcing us to discuss them. And I think this is good. It's better to discuss them, not discuss them. We have a couple of audience questions, um, so I'll, I'll just read them out and uh, and then anyone from the panel should just jump in. Um, from uh, Nicole, uh, is there a relationship between our understanding of the human mind and the potential of AI? For example, if the ins and outs of consciousness are better understood, will AI benefit? I think this comes down to um, the distinction between generalist and specialist AI. So most of what we're all talking about is specialist AI. You know, it just makes predictions about a specific thing, like how like how long it will take you to get to work. And generalist AI is more like machines that actually think like people, or at least act like people, and can kind of try to fool you into thinking that they're people. The better we understand how our brains work, the, the better we become at making computers that resemble our brains. However, of all the research in AI and of all the practical like engineering and stuff that we build with AI, like 95% plus is specialist AI. Almost all the stuff that's in the news that we're talking about, that's in the tools that you might use at home, all that stuff is specialist AI. Only a small number of people really are working on generalist AI. And so uh, I wouldn't count on major breakthroughs in generalist AI anytime soon, uh, regardless of whether we make major breakthroughs in understanding how our own minds work. Um, um, oh, yeah. Oh, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, Derek, please go ahead. Uh, you know, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, AI as an endeavor has has always uh, been interested in in trying to model uh, human intelligence and mimic and and you know create rep replicas essentially of human intelligence as a way of achieving artificial intelligence, and th these attempts have led to some of the fundamental approaches in AI that we use in these specialist AI applications. Right, so the old expert system that drove that photocopier was an attempt to model the thinking process of somebody of a learned individual in a in a domain area, uh, and the machine learning it does uh, has a networked model of associations, which is supposed to it was inspired by networked models of memory and how 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 the brain works, synapses and uh, fire and, and and connect and so forth. So there is this kind of simpatico uh, relationship of you know, modeling intelligence and then under uncovering new applications as a result of trying to uh, model intelligence. Um, you know, it's funny, uh, it's not just AI that benefits from understanding human intelligence. Also, it's uh, it's all of all of computing interfaces, right? So in human computer interaction, 
uh, we've tried to model, we've, we've taken cognitive models of human intelligence to try to help us design better interfaces, better, better systems. And I will say that one of the interesting uh, things that uh, turns that we've had over the past decade has been away from these kind of purely cognitive models of thought, you know, of intel you know A that then to B and then to C, and more something a little bit more holistic, uh, you know, experience driven, looking at the phenomenology, the phenomenon of lived experience, uh, it, not just from the perspective of an individual necessarily, but also including you know others as groups, uh, you know communities, the influences of, of other contextual factors. And it's a much richer, more sort of social science, uh, let's say, uh, uh, oriented um, approach to understanding uh, humans and their in and their interaction with technology. I don't know what that says about uh, potential future uh, AIs. Actually, I know that some of the early attempts to create social systems that were based on uh, social science theories were total flops, like uh, creating um, work uh, workflow systems based on speech act theory, uh, which comes from the social sciences, this idea that you can structure, so, uh, speech act theory is a great way of explaining uh, how people converse, but a really bad way of predicting how they will act. And, uh, but you know, that's an attempt, and and through these attempts, we we sometimes yield uh, useful uh, uh, technical approaches, as we've seen recently with machine learning. Sometimes they fail, as we've seen with the speech act theory example. And I don't know if I've answered your question. I kind of got lost there for a minute. Nur. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that, that, I like that answer. To be honest with you, I'm good okay. with it, but I don't know about the uh, <laughs> others. Um, I just wanted to add that. Um, okay. You know, going with my car example, except the car, I actually like to learn ins and outs of things, and that's why, you know, <laughs> I like science and engineering. But um, going back to it, you know, in computer networks uh, for routing, for example, I used uh, ant based uh, uh, algorithms. So there are different types of AI, and the ant based algorithms actually, well, as the name suggests, tries to uh, get inspired and a mimic, if you like, how the ants uh, go from their nest to the food, right? And then this helps with the uh, routing algorithms because you are going from source, your, your host node, to the target, to the food, so to speak. So there are different types of AI algorithms. Um, I think deep learning is mostly uh, in the, uh, you know, most popular one in the news with Google, OpenAI, etc. But actually, there is symbolic logic, as Derek was talking about, expert systems, reasoning, um, insect-based algorithms. So not only ants um, that I'm familiar with, but also there are bee, bee colonies, bee swarms, um, using them for uh, different uh, areas. Um, so the more, in where I'm going with it is, the more... Um, different types of intelligence from insects to humans to animals to uh, even within each one of these species different types of intelligence exist for everyday activities and environment navigation so to me uh, the more we learn about them um, probably the ins and outs probably we will be able to first of all know whether it's good to use or not um, second of all um, understand and maybe by experiencing with them uh, move it along the way of trust um, so going back to the original question learning ins and outs of anything except my car is useful i think we have another question here from dana um, is it possible that we are seeing the rise of a new class, not just a redistribution of wealth to the upper class? And I'm not sure if uh, if Dana was talking here specifically about uh, AI itself as a class. Uh, I think I think this is a really good question. So, in every generation, there are young people that you always hear about in the news who. Uh, get a great idea and pull the company together and and do some cool stuff and it gets bought for six hundred million dollars and and everyone goes oh what an amazing success right and uh, and this gives you the idea that like oh anybody could could do this right and it is true that sometimes people from very humble beginnings go on to to make. Uh, the big company that gets bought for 600 million. But th the fact is that 
intergenerational wealth is is one of the best predictors of um, of our success in life. And it's because if you think about it, if your parents are rich and you're interested in computers, A, your parents buy you the computers that you want to play with. B, you don't have to go get a part-time job. You can just spend all your time working on open source projects and learning stuff and figuring stuff out. You get to go to the best university. You know, you're know, you not distracted by monetary worries. If you grow up poor, you know, you don't have time for volunteer work because you have to do actual work to get paid because you need money, right? And you maybe you can't go to the university you want to go to because you can't afford it. You've got to go to the one that's nearby because then you can stay with your parents and save money, right? And you don't have you can't borrow money from anybody to start that business that is going to grow up and make lots of money. So the it, when you start out from humble beginnings, it's not that it's impossible. It's just that there are many more barriers to being one of those people who becomes a big tech leader. And that means that while it seems like with every generation, there's these new people who climb the ladder, it does not really like that. Really, uh, most of the money just, just goes back to people who, were afflu who came from affluent families to begin with. Is there anything uh, from the other two of you to weigh in there? It, it, and, and, and I'm wondering maybe um, if uh, if Dana did mean that AI itself is uh, a class that we should be looking at, what what would we say about that? Well, I I, I would actually I just wanted to build a little bit on on the uh, the IT as a as a as an emergent uh, class um, of the IT professional. I think that what you see historically. If you take India, for example, there are um, you know some individuals who start companies and do extraordinarily well in India. But the industry in India uh, is largely like the average uh, IT person in India is doing work in uh, I, I, like let's say quality assurance, maybe, but probably uh, also like help desk help help desk work, and in the new AI. Uh, what seems to be happening in uh, in India uh, is that uh, companies are emerging that will allow for that will basically be hand made classifiers. They'll they'll do the they'll classify things for for sort of trained uh, for supervised learning algorithms for 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 AI, which is not doesn't seem like they'll they'll look at a picture and they'll say. That's a that's a street light, and I'll look at another picture and say, no, that's a that's a or that's a that's a dog, that's a muffin, that's a whatever, right? Um, maybe not exactly like that, but those types of classifications um, and to help the to help train systems, which you know isn't necessarily a great new. Uh, I wouldn't say that's a, 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 a an emancipation uh, necessarily, right? That's not going to create uh, a new well healed. Uh, a class of individuals. That kind of work seems more like factory work than knowledge work, uh, for example. Um, I think AI is here uh, to live with us um, because from the network perspective, it's definitely the case because of the issue of scaling up. Um, any type of automation, not just AI, any type of automation. We don't know what future will bring in terms of automation, but definitely uh, if I can give one suggestion to everyone, including my child, is that um, make sure you are educated in this. Somehow uh, learn about this. So that's a personal choice, but collectively I think, um, we need to educate our kids as the next generation from elementary school onwards about automation, about technology, about computing. And, and it's great to see, for example, our faculty started, right, with lots of new initiatives with the provincial government at the federal level in other provinces. This is happening. Um, we have to bring our um, our, our society uh, collectively to a level where these things are accessible. Going back to Paul's point, we cannot leave it to the person being rich to be able to access it. We really have to start this accessibility. And, and to me, as educators, this is really 
ethically one of our duties. We need to make it accessible. And um, because it's here, I don't think it's going to be a class in itself because this is a personal view. I look at AI as something we create, as a tool that we use. If that's the case, we need to make sure everybody, AI is the hammer, everybody has to be able to understand how to use a hammer. If they don't want to use it, fine, don't use it, but know how to understand. And we need to therefore make it accessible. But it's really my humble opinion. <laughs> Education has come up a, a couple of times tonight, um, and I know we have uh, we have students, we have people from the general uh, public listening. And um, as you're talking, I am one thing that's going through my head is just how much self education I need to do just to keep up with this conversation. Um, so I, I guess a two part question: um, What would be your advice to somebody who's um, who's beginning in in working in this field or learning about this field, how, how would they become rounded, I guess, in all of the things that they need to educate themselves in? Um, and so, so for somebody who is already perhaps technically minded, and then what about those of us who, who don't have any grounding in this field? How would, how would people who don't have a grounding in this field become more rounded? Um. I think we can make use of how we uh, roll out to driving and cars, <laughs> if I may go back to that. Um, so people choose to drive or not to drive. And if they are choosing to drive, we are bringing uh, different options for them. And uh, we even have, you know, the earliest age of getting a driving license. And I'm hoping that um, through the uh, IEEE initiative and similar initiatives of that nature. These conversations, these discussions will go to a point where um, we are going to be able to roll out a similar um, type of initiatives for our young generation. Um, I think it's already started by a computer studies course um, appearing in uh, our schools. And uh, so this is kind of the first level of ABC, getting used to the technology, started using it, and eventually learning the different ways of uh, uh, using the technology and the automation um, going through the years, but obviously giving an option. Um, currently, I'm aware of through my own kid that there are classes uh, in schools in computer science and principles, for example, which are for uh, people maybe who don't want to be engineers or computer scientists, but uh, get a literacy and get an idea about the, uh, the, the ground, so to speak, in, in this field. And then um, again, in, in, in the high school, at least I'm aware that uh, once you get your computer science principles, you can move into coding. And, um, uh, you know, there are also lots of open source initiatives too, and I'm not against any one of them, but I think um, together with our schools, our universities, our governing bodies, our advocacy groups, community groups, everyone should be involved. Really, we need to put our hand under this uh, rock, so to speak, and, and make it accessible for, for everyone. Yeah. And if we I, can I, make people learn how to drive, I think this is possible. <laughs> I, I, I totally agree with her. I mean, I think that uh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a strong believer in interdisciplinary uh, teaching, interdisciplinary research as well, uh, specifically for this reason, because, I mean, we, we work, as I've mentioned before, if we work as computer science scientists in a computer science bubble, um, we, we don't know, you know, how people want to use the technologies. We don't discover mm -hmm. new opportunities uh, for these technologies. Um, we need to democratize access, right? We need to allow for people who have uses, uh, potential uses for these new technologies to have access to them and for somebody to do the translational work, you know, and that's not the same as somebody developing an algorithm or developing a new machine learning model classifier. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a different kind of work. The translational work, uh, you know, identifying needs, uh, understanding contexts, and uh, you know, creating systems that can be used by non-technical people 
is one of the fundamental challenges of, of computer science and always will be. Um, and that's, that's one of the ways that we do this, right? Um, I think the history of computer literacy um, has, I mean, at first, uh, the hope was that computer literacy would involve coding uh, literacy, right, in some ways. Like, you'd be able to make the machine do things that you wanted it to do. But over the past couple of decades, it was more expedient to have a small group of people who knew how to program computers develop applications and they have this sort of application model where you're kind of held at a at a you know arm's length from the actual capability of the system to do something very very straightforward and 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 uh, task oriented. There is a, definitely a place for that, but I think we also need to look more holistically at what you know computing education, from, as Snur is saying, from the you know through uh, primary school into secondary school and not, and uh, into post-secondary in other domains. I once was a faculty member at a college, at the Ontario College of Art and Design. And uh, some of the students there were amazingly technical uh, and they were able to do things with computers, you know, that, uh, I, I mean, I think it was, you know, really phenomenal. So those kinds of people exist in all in all areas. And I think th those uh, those types of individuals and their interests should be cultivated, right? It shouldn't just be, oh, you're into computers, you know, that you want to sit down in front of a of a of a green screen, you know, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and 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 code. That's not necessarily that's an old stereotype, and that's not necessarily the case. We we have uh, time for just one more question from the audience. Um, Mel asks, how much collaborative AI research is being done in Canada? And are there any major or specific areas of interest in which this research is being done? And as a follow-up, what, what are the main sources of funding for that research? So the practical side of it. Um, Paul, do you, do you want to address that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, the short answer is lots of collaborative AI research is going on in Canada. I mean, deep learning was invented in Canada. Deep learning is like one of the most important contemporary AI approaches, right? Uh, and in terms of funding, um, the way the Canadian government likes to work is if if a, when, when a company, when a private company wants to uh, spend money on research and development, they when they collab whenever a private company wants to spend money on research, they can collaborate with the university. It doesn't have to be Dalhousie, any university. You can collaborate with the university, and basically whatever money your private company wants to put into that research project with the university, the government matches that money. Sometimes it matches a bit more. Sometimes it's, it's like two thirds to, to your half, but, um, but basically the government matches money that uh, the private companies throw at universities for research. So if you're interested in, uh, in doing research in AI and you want to get a, a leg up on the other companies in, in your space, right? reach out to your local AI professor and ask, hey, do you have anybody who can work on this? Is there anybody at your at your local university who can uh, who can help with this thing, whatever this thing is? And I guarantee you, somebody will get back to you. Uh, professors, most professors love to work with uh, uh, with companies. Um, and it's a for us, it's a big win to negotiate a, a research deal with a, with a company. So you'll find most profs to be very receptive. We heard it here first. Reach out to a professor. You have three here. Um, thank you so much to everyone for the questions. Uh, this was a great discussion. Um, and thank you as well to our panelists for your expertise, your knowledge uh, on this timely topic. I know we could have kept going for another hour, I think, but we, we have to we have to leave it here. So thank you uh, all of you for your time. Thank you to our viewers. And stay well, take care, and have a good night. Bye-bye.